Okay, we're here at the end of the session. And again, this is Teddy, this is Chloe, and this wild man is Bear. And this is the roadmap to success. Now, it was originally called, it was primarily uh, concerned with her. She likes to nip guests when they come in. First, when they come in, she nips them and then she runs away. And after that, they're buddies. So the very first thing we did was we created a, uh, a controlled environment when, we, when I entered. So the guardian was able to open one of the doors, the inside door, and leave the outside door closed. Or, you know what I'm saying. And then basically, uh, what I did is I waited, and I waited for the energy to come down a little bit. When it came down somewhat, then I offered Bear a treat, but I made him sit before I gave him the treat. He seemed to be more boisterous at the door. She was kind of jumped up on her guardian, was just focusing on her guardian. Um, after he got the treat, he kind of settled down a little bit. I asked her to come over, asked her to sit, and then gave her a treat for sitting. Now, anytime you give a dog a treat, the command word should be said immediately after the treat goes into their mouth. It activates their pleasure receptors, and they look more favorably upon that command word. She's doing a great job of licking in between my fingers to get to the treats that I have in my hand. Um, and so as soon as I did that, her demeanor changed and she was very comfortable and relaxed. I'm hoping that all the rules and structure and things we went over in this session are going to have a positive impact on the dog's behavior overall and is going to take care of that problem. Um, but in the short term, the guardians might want to arrange to have a neighbor or a friend come over and practice that maybe a couple times a week um, so that you can, she just gets comfortable when people come. They're not invaders. As a matter of fact, they're here to deliver treats for me and they're the best treats I've ever had. We're using chicken liver. And let's stop licking my leg. You're going to give me a wet spot. Okay, so um, I sat down with the guardians to ask what rules the dogs had, and basically the dogs didn't really have any rules. Uh, the guardian who's filming this does a good job of exercising the dog, but it's a longer exercise uh, once a day, and I recommend uh, sprinkling throughout the day. So a couple things we can do for exercise is, uh, you're going to get down, buddy. Well, how about we stay here for a minute, and you should stop licking. Teddy, stay. Stay, buddy. There we go. Teddy, stay. Look at that. You get good treats for staying. So uh, one of the things I talked about the Guardians doing is starting an exercise journal. So basically what you do is just get a spiral notebook, write the date at the top, and then write a column for each dog, and then write the time on this side. And then basically you write down the time and how long the walk was. Instead of going for one hour walk, it'd be better to go for three 15 minutes walks, or two, or excuse me, uh, four 15 minutes walk, walks, or three uh, 20 minute walks, uh, sprinkled throughout the day. But there are alternative ways of exercising the dogs. I pulled out a laser, they were very interested in chasing a laser. Him, not as much as the Maltesis, but a little bit. Um, another way to do this would be fetch. They like to play fetch. Um, it's a great way to burn energy. Um, another thing I like to do is go to the top of the stairs, touch the dog's nose with a treat, throw it to the bottom of the stairs, let the dog run down to get the bottom of the stairs and get it, come up with a command word that means uh, to the bottom, maybe call it downtown. And then ask the dog to come back up, and then we say, you know, another word for whatever type of, you know, part of town we're in, or something that's funny. Mm -hmm. Remember, dogs can read your facial expressions, so come up with funny command words for the new commands. And I'd like the guardians to come up with new command, uh, new uh, tricks for a couple, uh, for the dogs to help boost their self-esteem. Uh, but for the uh, stairs, you throw it to the bottom of the stairs down, uh, downtown and call it back upstairs and call it Hollywood or whatever you want to do. And then basically count each up down as one. And then basically, the first time I would do it with each dog, make sure they have an empty stomach. Dogs have a distended stomach. You can actually twist around and flip up and pressurize if it's got food in it when they're exercising. So about an hour after exercise, after eating, they shouldn't be uh, wait an hour before you exercise. Yeah. So basically, I would do it with each dog independently, and then basically uh, just go with with Chloe and just keep on doing this until she stops coming up to you. And that way, you know how many up downs is her maximum throughput. And then basically do it with each dog separately, so the other dogs are not competing. And then you know what their maximum number is. And then basically for the exercise journal, you write down, okay, went for a 15 minute walk, um, uh, you know, for each dog. Uh, went for, uh, we did uh, 10 up downs on the stairs um, at, at two hours later, at the t whatever the time it was. And then we did uh, the laser game. They chased the laser throughout the house for this period of time with as many revolutions. Um, another one you can do is scent training. So what I would do is uh, basically just Google scent training. And it's basically hiding treats in a room and letting the dogs walk around and uh, try to find them. It's very physically training for them to use this muscle. Mm -hmm. um, and then basically what happens is that, uh, at the end of the day, since there are two guardians, I would like each guardian to have an assignment notebook and then give it and put the day and then put a letter grade, A through F, for each dog. And then basically the next day, we play around with the number of repetitions or the number of exercises. Also, we should put in, if there's something really, you know, the dog's freaked out about something, put that in there. What time you eat, put that in there, stuff like that. Um, and so you're kind of creating a journal of notable events as well as the exercise. Then the end of each day, like I said, in a different notebook, Guardian A is going to put, I think he, uh, he had an A, she had a C, he had a B. 
Okay, well, she had a C, so let's play around with her elements. Let's get her a couple more rep exercises. Mm -hmm. um, and then eventually, event, you'll get A plus behavior for all three dogs. Now you know their roadmap or what sort of exercise they need to be successful. They're little dogs, they're not Dalmatians or Vichelas, they don't need a ton of exercise. Um, and so a lot of this we can do inside, it's gonna be more convenient for the humans. Outside, walks are great for, uh, for leadership, but they're not really good for exercise. Sprinting is not as good as walking. And so if they're sprinting after the laser or uh, to get to the bottom of the stairs, get the treat or to fetch the ball, that's a much more efficient workout. So start the exercise journal and that will really help mitigate some of these problems. It's not gonna fix the problems, but it'll help make it, fixing them easier. Um, the next thing we talked about are rules and structure. The dogs really didn't have any rules and so they saw the humans as peers, but then also when they would do things that the humans don't like, we would pet them. Now I wanna talk real quickly about human psychology versus dog psychology. For humans and when it comes to rules, we think of rules as a negative. It's a limitation, it's something that we don't like because they're forced upon us when we're children. And then breaking the rules becomes a positive for us. We get to stay up late, we celebrate that, breaking the rule as a victory. So as adults, we look at enforcing rules as being a mean person or something undesirable. And so we try to take away all rules and structure. Well, for dogs, they go through life probing, waiting for you to tell them that's the line, that's the limit. And if they go through probing and nobody ever corrects them, they get the impression that they have the same authority as us, or in some cases, more authority than us. And so the lack of rules actually is confusing for dogs. And letting, uh, enforcing them consistently is also uh, very confusing for a dog. If there's an area where the dog is gonna probe, and we think, oh God, you've, I've told him no 25 times, why do you keep on trying? Well, I'm trying to find out, does the boundary go all the way around? I'm really being thorough as a dog. But really what happens is we block 20 times and we get distracted with the phone call and the dog crosses the threshold and it's like, ah, in, my, in this house I have to ask 21 times to get my way. Next time we block 30 times, the dog's like, I have to ask 31 times. Or we block 50 times and the dog's like, all right, finally, obviously I'm not allowed to do that thing. And then we decide to invite the dog up on the furniture or whatever it is. The dog's like, now I don't know, up from down. I thought I wasn't allowed to do it. Now I guess I can. And, I'm, and we train our dogs to be defiant. Now for dogs, anything that a dog is doing when we pet it is what we're rewarding. And so if we pet a nervous dog, we'll make it more nervous. An excited dog will make it more excited. When you guys come home, if the dogs are excited, ignore them. Don't tell them no, just ignore them. As soon as they're calm, start reaching for the dog. As soon as you do, they'll start wiggling, pull your arm back and continue your business. What you're saying is through your actions, when you're calm, you're, I'm very interested in engaging with you and playing with you. As soon as you get excited, I lose all interest. I don't care, because I'm a man of the world. I got other things to do. But as soon as you're calm again, then I reach towards you again. So after a while, the dogs start learning that this behavior is what, what will get attention, the other behavior will not. Most of us, when it comes to training, we focus on, pot, on re rewarding the things that we want. But disengaging the second the dog starts to do it is hugely important. Sit, that's passive training we're talking about in a sec. And so if I'm petting Teddy, and in the middle of petting, he puts his paw on me and I continue petting him, this is a dominance move. He's trying to tell me to keep on petting me. But as soon as he puts his paw there, I would stop petting. And after a while, he's like, I like the petting. As soon as I try to control it, you stop petting me. So maybe I'll just sit back and enjoy the ride. And that's kind of what we're looking for. So uh, basically, um, for the dogs, the more that we have rules and we enforce the rules, the more the dog sees us acting like a leader, the more they practice starts restraining themselves, which is a skill set these dogs need desperately. And not so much him, <laughs> uh, but these two for sure. Okay. And so uh, some of the rules we went over, not being allowed on the furniture. Now, there's a, this is a big house. There's a lot of furniture. Yes, I'm sorry, buddy. Um, so what I recommend is getting X mats, letter X and M-A-T-S. And I would get like, you know, for this is the main hangout room, I'm assuming, that we're in. Yeah. So I would get maybe one or two or three for this couch, two for that couch, two for those chairs. You might have to put a couple over there on the leather couch if they yeah. decide to start going over there. The X mats will prevent the dogs from getting up there. That way, if we're here, we can just easily put them here. We don't have to worry about policing or anything. Yeah. Now, if the dog jumps up here, what, what I would do is take a treat, touch the dog's nose, and I would throw it on the ground. I'm not doing it now because I want them here with the sh in, in the shot. But I touch the nose, I throw it on the ground, and then as soon as they jump down and lick, and lick it up off the floor, then I would say the word off. Now I'm creating a command word to get off the couch and creating a motivation for the dog to want to go off the couch. Um, I'll talk about motivation here hopefully in a minute. I'll hopefully I'll remember. Um, I also would teach them to leave all the areas that, that are uh, part of the rules. So one of the rules is if the human's eating food in this little area right here, the dog should not be allowed on this carpet. It's hardwood floors and the rest of the room. So to teach the dogs to do that, I would touch the dog's nose with a treat and then toss the treat right outside of the designated zone. When the dog goes outside and licks it up, I would say the word out. Um, so off to get off the couch, out to leave the room. 
I would also do this with every room in the house. Take these treats, split them in half, because they're little treats for these guys. He can get a full one for each one. Go to a doorway, touch the dog, and do this with each dog separately. Touch the dog's nose with the treat, toss it out of the room. When the dog goes three feet out of the room to lick it up, we would say the word out. And then it comes back and do the second for the other half of the treat. Do that for every doorway in the house, and then repeat the process going the other direction. So now we can tell the dog to leave any room and the dog has practice doing it and motivation to want to do that. Um, and that way it's in context and they understand what we're saying. Um, some of the rules, not being allowed to be within seven feet of a human who's eating, not allowed to be in the kitchen where the humans are preparing food. So we wanna create this uh, scenario so the dogs know how to leave the room first before we escort them out, uh, which is what I did in the video above on structured feeding. Um, okay, so um, other rules, you have to sit at a door before I let you in or out of the door. Um, what are the other rules that I went over? Uh, for the bed, if the guardians don't want to uh, not let them on the bed for sleeping, I would recommend you know, having that curtailed as well, getting a dog bed so they sleep off there. Uh, but if you do, then make sure the humans get in the bed and that you invite the dogs up. And I would invite them one at a time. Uh, you might want to come up with, like I did for feeding the dogs, a com separate command word for each dog to come up in the dog bed. That way, if Teddy is misbe or excuse me, Bear is misbehaving, I can invite Teddy up and uh, Chloe without him by giving them specific command words. Um, okay. Um, I also went over petting with the purpose of passive training. The dogs were jumping up the humans, and the humans continued petting. And that rewards the dog and also tells the dog jumping up on me is the best way to ask me for attention. Also, when a dog climbs on top of someone when they're coming through a doorway, it can be a way of claiming them or saying, I'm in charge around here. So if we pet the dog when it's doing that, we're rewarding the dog. So instead of what I, uh, of what I uh, correcting them, what I like to do is give them a redirect them. So if Teddy comes up and he's nudging me or scratching me for attention, I tell him to sit. When he sits, I pet him under his chin and say the word sit and only the word sit. Not good sit, not Teddy, just sit. And then I can pet him as long as I want. Um, after a while, Teddy will learn, if I come up and tell the human what to do, nothing happens anymore. But if the human tells me what to do and I do it, I get a reward. Now I have added motivation. What will happen is after a while, the dog will start coming in front of you and sitting down to prepay for the attention. What he does, make sure we recognize that. I usually say recognize or testify or something like that. So if somebody says recognize, I look at the dog and if Teddy's standing there, I would assume he came and pet him and say, come. If he's sitting, I pet him and say, sit or whatever it is. Now, if the dog's already sitting when, I, when he nudges me, I'd ask him to come and sit over here or ask him to lay down. They just have to do something to change their state or prepay for the attention. Now, uh, I use the watchword of paycheck. So if one of the guardians comes in the room and the other guardian is petting the dog and standing up, they say paycheck, you have to immediately stop petting. You tell the dog to sit or do something else, pat him on his chin, say sit. Then you can say, actually, ask the dog to sit before he came in the room. He stood up when he heard you coming down the hallway, and David said that's a lot, which it is. Hey, buddy. Uh, I can't demand, you can't, that's demanding the treats. I can't, I can't, I'm literally talking about that right now. Uh, so basically, uh, what we want to do is um, uh, reward those dogs for the desired behaviors and entice them to start offering those behaviors. Make sure you do recognize it though, because if you don't, they'll go back to nudging you, scratching you, and doing the rest of those things. Any attention is validating, which is why a lot of dogs misbehave, because that's the quickest way to get my attention. I bark, you, you correct me. I jump up on you, you correct me. I sit in front of you, you ignore me. Well, the thing you want, you seem to pay me the least for, so I'm gonna do it the least. We're gonna flip that script. Now, the other thing I like to do is called passive training. Passive training, for petting with a purpose, it's redirecting the dog and do something you want when it's initiating the contact. Or if I wanna pet the dog, I'm still gonna ask it to sit or do something to earn it first. So it helps redefine the leader follower dynamic. Passive training is what I did a minute ago, is when the dog voluntarily offers you behavior that you don't entice in any way, shape, or form, and within that three second window, you pet the dog to reward it. So every time the dog comes to you, you should pet it and say, come. If you like the kiss, the licks, you might pet it when it licks you and say kisses. Um, if it lays down, you pet it and say crash or chill or whatever the fun word is that you come up with it. If they bring you a toy, name each individual toy, and they bring you a toy, say the name of that toy. So now you can say, no, I said get Hamburglar. That's Trump, I want Hamburglar. And so it again creates that vocabulary, which is nice for the dogs. Um, and then the more that we have that vocabulary, the more descriptive we can get about asking them to leave the room or getting it a treat or whatever, uh, a toy or whatever the case may be. Um, passive training is, like I said, a really effective way of doing this. Both of these are really effective because what we're doing is rewarding the dog for things that we want, either through our direction or when they offer them themselves. And the more the dogs get petted for sitting, the more they're going to pro-offer that sit automatically. Now, I also went over, uh, I like to see the guardians look for ways to delay gratification. Like a good example is what we did for the, for the meal time. So basically we put the food in the bowls, but the dogs are not allowed to eat it. They have to wait for permission to eat. 
or to go through the door before I throw the ball or whatever it is. Look for different opportunities to do that. Um, let me see. We also, I walked the guardian through a focus exercise. Um, and uh, if you forget how to do that, make sure you let me know. But remember when you're doing it, it's one second, one second. So always raise it to your nose in that one second movement and don't pause. So one, a lot of people go like. Yeah. So just boom, boom. The faster you get in the dog's mouth, the more effective. And then say the word focus after it goes in the dog's mouth. Then immediately reload and the dogs are, and until the dog is just pretty much staring at you the whole time. Then I go one second, two seconds for the second movement for all 12 treats. Mm -hmm. And then each guardian should, each dog should do this once a day with each guardian uh, for a week. And get up to that point where you're at that 15 second mark for that second movement only. That way, uh, and then, uh, and what we wanna do is we're gradually elongating it. Don't move too far too fast. If you go from one second to 15 seconds of that second movement, it's five seconds the dog looks away. Mm -hmm. And that's hard to stop. This is an exercise you really need to practice a lot for a week because dogs start getting bored with it, I found. So I, within a week, you want the dog to be able to uh, practice it for 15 seconds. And practice all over the house. Don't just practice here. Once the dog's doing and make sure there's nothing going on. Nobody cooking food, the other dogs, and there's no construction or anything that distracts the dog. Eventually, we use this to get them through distractions. But when they're learning, we want the easiest version possible. So once the dogs can do it for 15 seconds uh, with anybody in the house, the next step is go out, out on the lawn and I, or in the backyard and practice it there. Now at this point, we're gonna, we're gonna go back to one second, one second, but we can progress faster. Maybe one second, one second for five treats, and one second, two seconds for five treats, and one second, three seconds for five treats, mm -hmm. or however many treats it comes out to, those 15, I guess. Um, and we get to the point where uh, they can do that again for 15 seconds outside with no distractions. Then we do it on walks, and do it with each dog walking separately. When there's nobody around there, there's no reason for them to react. Say focus, they look up at you as you continue walking. Raise your nose and go down to the dog's mouth. Duck down a little bit for these two, pop in their mouth and say the word focus. Then after doing this, at this point, you're probably about two weeks in. Then if I'm walking down the street and I see another dog, I can say focus, the dog redirects their attention up to me, but you have to do it really, really early. The mm -hmm. closer the dog gets, the harder it's going to be for the dog to do that. Also, the dog's other dog's behavior is going to impact it. If the other dog has this energy, it's gonna be nice and easy to redirect. If that dog is barking and bouncing and lunging around, mm -hmm. you're gonna have need more distance. Mm -hmm. Anytime your dogs are reacting, the best thing you do is increase distance between your dog and that dog, or whatever they're reacting to. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to walk around a car or a shrub or something, and then once they've broken that, then do the focus exercise. The focus exercise, remember, stops production of cortisol, which is the stress hormone, which happens when they're out and they see another dog and they start freaking out. And if you can catch them at the genesis, the very beginning of them wanting to do that versus the uh, when they're really worked up, it's going to be much easier. Um, also, dogs can read human facial expressions. So I'd like the guardians to come up with funny command words. The words we used up in the dog training or the feeding video or tuna for ahi tuna uh, uh, for sushi, sushi and then baguette because he's a Frenchie. And so those, those words are kind of fun. If I want my dog to lay down, I say crash or chill. If I want to go forward, I say charge. If I want to back up, I say retreat. Um, so coming up with these fun command words makes other people smile and laugh, which can help the dogs be, give them added motivation to want to do that. Most dogs are only motivated by treats and affection. Well, now I make everyone happy when I do it. Just like a little kid who comes and does a show when you visit your friend's house, the child comes out and does a dance or a song number, you, you laugh and the kid feels invigorated about it. So if we can actually give the, make the dogs feel good by coming up with these funny command words, it's more motivating for them. I'm laughing because he's snoring. Yeah. Um, all right, um, so come up with a list of official command words. Right now the dogs only know about two or three commands. So now we've got an extra one, we're gonna teach them with the, with the treats, uh, with feeding them, but dogs should know at least 10 commands. Dogs that are uh, insecure are more apt to be uh, to lash out. And I'm pretty sure that's why some, both of these dogs are kind of reacting that way. He's much more relaxed his energy level. But it, uh, what I like this guardians to do is go to YouTube and find easy dog tricks to train. I mean, you could do something as simple as have the dog in front of you, hold a treat in front of his nose, and have it walk around in a circle and then give it to it. Say, I call that hurricane. Um, and so the reason I do that one is if your dog gets humped at the dog park and you teach it to spin, <laughs> And dog, dog humps it, you say spin, it does it once, dog tries again, mounts again, spin, does it twice. After three or four times, the dog will go look for another dog to mount. So it's fun and easy to teach. Mm -hmm. And then your dogs are misbehaving, you say uh, you know, hurricane, and all three dogs do little circles. That's funny. Um, and again, it's super easy to train. And now you have a different way of redirecting your dog's attention. Um, you have boosted the dog's self-esteem because they feel better about them because they have more skills. And they have a deeper respect for the humans because the humans are ones and engender them with that 
uh, feeling of confidence because they're the ones that taught them that exercise. So I'd like to have the guardians take turns doing this once a week. So maybe on Sunday or Monday, whatever your day is where you can recharge. Um, and you'll find that it's invigorating to train the dogs this way. And uh, train them separately and just teach them all to circle or whatever it is. And then once the guardian has taught the dogs to do it, teach the other guardian what the command is. And all week long, you should practice that exercise. At the end of the week, then the next guardian takes over and teaches them a different exercise. Roll over and play dead should be two of the ones that you teach because they're just fun. <laughs> and when you teach those, teach them in a row because they kind of <laughs> use the same skill sets for both of them. But again, I don't say roll over, I don't say uh, roll over, I say stunt dog. <laughs> I don't say play dead, I say compone. So come up with these funny command words so that, you know, again, if you have friends come over and the dogs are misbehaving and you say compone and the dog flops down, your friends are going to think that's funny. Uh, let me see. Uh, when you're doing, uh, practicing uh, the not being allowed in the kitchen when you're preparing food or when you're eating food, warm up. Microwave a piece of bacon, put it down on the dinner table, cut it up into pieces, and then, uh, hey buddy, I'll give you one if you hang out a little bit longer. Stay or sit. Um, and then you pretend like you're cooking or you pretend like you're eating. And the dog comes in, you block the same way I just showed you in the video above. I keep going over there because that's where we did that video. Uh, but you block them from coming in and, and you keep on doing that until this dog sits or lies down beyond the boundary. Then you can put the bacon away and eat your actual meal or cook your actual uh, meal. Um, and that way the dogs are kind of warmed up and practice what we're doing and they know how to do it. And this more you practice this, eventually they'll just go, you'll say out because you've already taught them to go out. Mm -hmm. And they'll, a lot of times they'll just go out on their own. Uh, let me see, what else do we cover? Um, I'm trying to think, I think I pretty much summarized that. Anything else you can think of? Oh, um, like the, the, the hissing. Oh, that, oh yeah, yeah. They, okay, yeah, that's a good one. That's important. So Bear was the big instigator. Anytime there was a barking outside or a noise outside, he barked and rushed the door. Now, just like humans, if you catch two people and having an argument, He's like, I'm going to go on patrol right now. <laughs> um, but if you catch two people having an argument and you catch them right at the genesis of the argument, it's very easy. Hey, okay, guys, I don't want to talk politics. I just want to enjoy each other's company. Sure. But if they've been talking about politics for 15 minutes and they're really in a heated debate, you come in and say, guys, I don't want to talk politics. They can't let it go because you're invested and you're all worked up. For dogs, they're going to be easier to redirect when their energy level is just at that genesis point. So um, I was disagreeing with Bear when he started to move over there. Lots of, at first it was, I disagreed when he was way over there, but eventually I started to do it at the beginning when he would just start to growl a little bit or raise his head. And I said it and he stopped immediately. So the way I stopped him was using what I call escalating consequences. I don't believe in punishing dogs. They don't really learn that way, but I do believe in consequences. So the rule is they're not allowed to be on the furniture. Well, if they're on the furniture and they start barking, now you have to get down. This is a privilege for good behavior. And if you don't display the behavior you want, you lose the privilege temporarily. And then when I think that you're doing well, then I might re-engage that privilege. So for the dogs, um, the way to, uh, pri privileges is separate, but to disagree with them, I use three escalating consequences. The very first thing I do is I hiss one time. Now I have 10 hisses. I have a level one hiss, which is like, a you see no response. I have a level 10 hiss where I actually have to hold my hand up because I'm saying it so intensely, I spit is coming out of my mouth. So just like us, there's a difference between no and yelling no at someone. So I hiss one time per incident, matching the dog's energy level. Dogs at level five energy, I hiss at level five or level six. Don't hiss at level two. They won't hear it or won't respect it. I translate the hiss as no, don't do that, or most effectively, don't even think about doing that. And warning or correcting the dog before it does the wrong thing is much more effective. Uh, and then that's the first consequence. The second consequence is I stand up abruptly. To a dog, standing up is the I mean business position. You're burning energy, you're standing up. When you stand up, your authority goes whatever direction your hips are pointed at. Right now, my authority is pointed directly at the camera if I was standing. Now, what the dog will do when you stand up, stand up abruptly. If you stand up casually, the dog's like, whatever. When dogs communicate with each other through movement, it's a singular, bold, overdramatic movement. So as soon as you stand up, uh, uh, stand up quickly and snap to face the dog, the dog will take a step backwards. Holy cow, he's serious. And then the dog's gonna say, I better make sure he's talking to me. Here, buddy. And so the dog will kind of wander around. Now, if the dog walks this way and I keep my hips pointed that way, the dog literally walked away from my authority. So as the dog gets up, I'm gonna pivot my hips and keep it facing the dog, wherever the dog is, until the dog uh, stops moving, stands, sits, or lies down. And when it does one of those three things, then I'm gonna take two steps backwards to tell the dog, because you stopped challenging me, I lowered my guard by stepping a little further away from you. Um, it's right here, buddy. See, he's trying to game me. Mm -hmm. I want him to come to me. 
So I'm kind of creating a little bit of leverage. And I'd like the guardians to get a habit of going to the dog as opposed to or having the dog come to them as versus going to the dog. Mm -hmm. So the second consequence, stand up abruptly, turn to face the dog, and keep the dog in front of you. Keep it in front of your hips, preferably without moving your feet, until the dog stands, sits, or lies down. When it does one of those three things, take two steps backwards and only two steps. No shuffling of your feet. No Wonder Woman or Superman pose. And then pause for one second after you take the two steps backwards. That's a way of putting a period at the end of the sentence. That's the second escalating consequence. The third one is to march deliberately at the dog. Now this is one thing I like the guardians getting get in the habit of doing. If the dogs are uh, on the floor sleeping, laying down, you can walk over them or around them. But if they're standing in your way, I want the guardians to walk through them as if they're not there. Don't shove walk them. Walk through them normally as if they're invisible. You'll make a little contact. I'm not saying kick your dog at all. But I want the, the dog uh, needs to understand when the human's walking, my job as a dog is having less authority as the human is to get out of their way to be polite to them. If we walk around them to be polite to the dogs, that tells the dog, you have more rank or status than I do, so I'm going out of my way, out of my way so you don't have to bother. So we want the dogs to get out and learn to get out of their way. Again, if they're sitting or lying down, walk around them, that's fine. When they're standing, they need to move out of your way. The third consequence involves giving and taking territory. Front facing is direct, is confrontational to the dog. Sideways is approachable. So what I do is I march deliberately at the dog. When I say march, I don't mean stomping your feet. I mean moving very briskly at the dog. And don't stop or slow down when you get to the dog. If the dog's there, run into the dog. Don't hurt them, but don't, if you're too soft, the dogs will not move out of your way. They need to learn, just like you, if you have a green light, you see a car going a million miles an hour, you don't go in that green in the intersection, you're gonna get T-boned. You let the idiot do their thing and then you uh, compensate. So we want, we're not the idiot in this case, but we want the dogs to understand that we're not slowing down. And so you march deliberately at the dog until it turns sideways to you. As soon as it turns sideways, stop in place immediately. Timing is that important. Three seconds is your maximum, a third of a second should be your goal. Once you freeze, put your feet together and then you go to the second consequence, you're pivoting until the dog's stationary, taking those two steps backwards as I described before. Crash, pass the training. Um, <clears throat> The only time this doesn't apply if the dog is already in a designated no dog zone. So I'm walking towards the dog and the dog turns sideways, but it's still in an area it's not supposed to be in. I would continue walking into the dog and bumping into them if necessary till they get to the line. As soon as they get to the line, that's where I stop enforcing it. Now the dog's trying to go around me, so I take a step to the side of the block. If it goes this way, I take a step to the side of the block this way. If it does it a third time, I step, take a step to the side and forward now. Now it becomes diagonal movements to move the dog further away from their target. And so, what we're, uh, and basically that's the third consequence, march, march deliberately at the dog until it turns sideways, then pivot, and then go to the second consequence and follow those instructions, unless the dog's somewhere like in an area that shouldn't be because somebody's eating or whatever. And enforcing these boundaries like we did for eating, for enforcing the kitchen when the humans are eating is very powerful because it helps the dog practice that self-restraint and it also helps the humans practice acting like a leader. We have a tendency to think we're the leader because we're the humans. Dogs don't see it that way. Dogs base us, based, uh, judge us based on our actions. So if we're not having any rules, we're not consistently following through, we don't seem to be acting like a leader in the dog's world, in eyes. But if we consistently enforce them, not letting them the furniture, not letting them in the kitchen when we're eating, not letting me sweat Teddy when he's eating his food and keeping him away, now the dogs see us acting like leaders and they're much more inclined to respect us and listen to us. All right, uh, now moving forward, uh, we might need to do a session uh, to do some bat training with the dogs if they are still aggressive to other dogs about a couple weeks, uh, maybe a month after the session. A lot of my clients will make the adjustments we made, we talked about in this video, in the house and the dogs get accustomed to it. It'll take them about a month to really change their behavior. But if in a month you're not seeing a difference outside, they're still being aggressive towards other dogs, let us know. We can set up a one hour bat session to work specifically on that problem. But my hope is and based on how well they responded, that you won't need that. You'd also use the hissing sound outside, mm -hmm. um, but I would prefer to redirect with a focus exercise yeah. um, and move around the car or whatever it is. Yeah. But I think the more that they take over, you guys take over the control of the leadership position, I think the dogs are reacting to other dogs thinking, my humans are gullible, they're gonna be taken advantage of by that border collie, so I have to yell at that border <laughs> collie, hopefully get it to stay away because my humans don't listen to me. Yeah. <laughs> and so the more that they start to see that you're in charge and our job is to listen to the humans, not the humans listen to us, then I can go off duty. I don't have to worry about protecting my humans on walks. That's the hope. But if not, like I said, let me know. Um, but make sure you train them to do some different tricks and commands. Mm -hmm. That will have a profound impact on their behavior. Um, so if that's the case, let me know in a couple weeks and we'll go through it. Now, if you forget how to do the focus, um, you have questions on the escalated consequences. I described everything pretty well, but if you have questions on any of these yeah. things, 
please message me if there's something else that happens. I can usually help with a phone call. I've got thousands of dog, free dog training videos that in my library on my website. I'm happy to show you guys a link if you need a more discretion. And it's very common or need more instruction. And it's very common to need uh, uh, little adjustments. Mm -hmm. So please call me or text me if things stop working or you get into any roadblocks right away. Uh, I see people that try to practice the wrong thing for too long and then I have to come back and fix that damage. So I'd rather you just call me if you're unsure or text me is the fastest way to reach me. I'll get back to you right away. All right, well this is usually a sign of a good successful <laughs> session for me. The dogs are wiped out. So this is Bear, this is Chloe, who was the primary ringleader who was probably the easiest to deal with. And this is Teddy, the, the good dog that is snoring <laughs> up a storm. Uh, it's like a little vibration <laughs> on my phone. This is the roadmap to success. Now remember, everything that you do trains your dog. Only sometimes you need it.